extremely rocky for the Mudville Nine that day. The score stood two to four with but one inning left to play. So when Cooney died at second and Burroughs did the same, a pallor wreathed the faces of the patrons of the game.
Casey still ignored it, and the umpire said, Strike to you! yourself grow old over the years on the screen. Oh my word. But that was David Everett. Was that an yeah. authorized recording for a bootleg? Uh, let us just say that we didn't know it was being done. But they're glad it was. Yes, there's the historical record of the hysteria. <laughs> years ago. Who did the, uh, do you know who actually wrote that particular adaptation of Casey? Yeah. I don't, I have to look it up. Yeah. I don't remember who wrote it. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's a published, anybody can do it. It's yeah. an orchestral piece that... Uh, but there'll always be the Marty Merkley performance. Well, that's gone into the, that's gone into the archives of the, of the, uh, of the baseball, there's a Casey at the Bat baseball thing, and that's gone into the archives. They took, called me and asked me if, if I could put that in there. And I think you probably gave him a copy of it or something. That's right. Yeah. So So he's in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Good. Eat your heart out, Don Greenhouse. <laughs> <laughs> Wherever you are. Exactly. Uh, I don't know the, I don't know, how did it, how did you connect with Chautauqua Institution? Well, um, that's, a, that's an interesting story. If I can remember that far back, uh, it was a, a, a lifetime ago, it seems to me. Uh, I was in Miami, Florida, uh, working with Michael Tilson Thomas, and we had started an orchestral academy called the New World Symphony, which was in Miami Beach. And uh, I was, had been there about five years, and uh, we had gotten the orchestra going, we had bought a theater, we had uh, we purchased the theater, we had renovated it, we had brought two hotels for the students that, the, uh, uh, that were accepted in the program. And I was looking for something different. I, I wanted to move on, wanted to do something else. And I was looking in, at that time, it was called the American Symphony Orchestra League, ASOL. 
They have since changed their uh, uh, their name. It's now the League of American Orchestras. It's no longer ASOL. Um, so I looked in there, and here was this ad for this place called Chautauqua Institution. And the ad was for a program director, and it said, I don't know what it said. It was very well written, but it said you needed to know everything about you know dance and orchestra and all this stuff. And I thought, that sounds really interesting. And I knew about Chautauqua because of the, of the Chautauqua movement and its place in early, late 19th and early 20th century. I used to get postcards from friends who were conducting. I'm here conducting Faust with the opera. I'm here playing. I'm subbing in this orchestra. Little ginger postcards with little gingerbread houses on them. Things like, this is a very strange place. Uh, <laughs> this is unbelievable. Uh, having a great time, all these kind of things. So I had gotten these, po I'd get these postcards over the years from people that I knew that were coming here to Chautauqua. So when I saw that, I thought, well, that's interesting. Uh, I'll just send in an application. What the heck? Don't expect anything to happen, but I thought I'd send it in. And lo and behold, I get a phone call that said, uh, we'd like to talk to you. Um, can you arrange a phone conversation? I did that. They said, can you arrange somebody to, interview, to give you a recommendation? I said, how about Michael Tilson Thomas? And they said, fine. So Mike, they set up a phone call with Michael Tilson Thomas. Next thing I get uh, is Dan Bratton calls me and said, you know, I'm going to be in, in Fort Lauderdale or West Palm Beach. Will you come up and meet me? So I drive up from Miami to West Palm Beach and sit in the bar with Dan. And we talk for a while. And this was, this was about in October, no, this was in October, November, this was in November, I guess, something like that. And then they asked me to come to Pittsburgh, an interview in Pittsburgh with a committee, and then they asked me to come to Chautauqua. This was, I believe, in February. <laughs> what year, by the way? And nine, this would have been 1991, February of 1991. And it was snow up to here, yep. cold. I did not own a coat. Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't own a winter coat. Dan said, I'll give you one of mine. <laughs> so I was to come up and was to fly from Pittsburgh to Jamestown. It was fogged in. You couldn't, which as many of you know from the days of flying in and out of Jamestown, it was can half the flights were always canceled. So I didn't make the dinner. I didn't make the dinner. I didn't make anything. I finally got in that night. Dan came and picked me up. It was snowing like crazy. He gave me a coat. He drove me around Jamestown and said, now this is Jamestown. And they dropped me off at, at the Holiday Inn, and I stayed at the Holiday Inn that night. And then the next day, they brought me up to Chautauqua, and I traipsed around through all the went to back of stage of Norton Hall and all these places, which was pretty dire at that point, and cold. And I thought, what am I doing? <laughs> Miami to you know Western New York in the cold. I swore I'd never live where it was cold again. And they called me and said, "You want the job?" And I said, "Okay, fine." <laughs> and I was here in March. I moved here in March, and we started the season in in uh, 1991. Was my first season. Your predecessor was uh... M.T. Menino, okay. Mary Teresa Menino, who left Chautauqua went to the Pittsburgh Cultural Trust, and then from there went up to um, Concord, New Hampshire, and ran that uh, festival, very successfully ran that building, that uh, place up there. What did she tell you about this place? I never spoke to MT. She had left in October, and Joe Johnson was putting the program together. So when I got here, there was no symphony in place. There was nothing in place. There were a few acts. Of course, the program, if you recall back, many of you that go back that far, the program, which we used to have a program guide, was like, you know, 10 pages. And that was it. You know, unlike the biblical portion of the program <laughs> now. So it was not that terrible to literally put the whole thing together in just a matter of months mm -hmm. in the symphony. And then we did the, if you always remember, we did the magic flute in the amp because it was the anniversary, it was Mozart's anniversary that year in 1991. So we did a semi stage version in the amp of. Of, uh, of the um, uh, 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 Magic Flute by Mozart. So it was my first season. It was just jump in and swim like crazy. I remember coming in and there were no files in the office. There was no history. There were no files in the office. There was nothing. I just, well, how much money is there to spend? Well, there it is. Make it happen. So we put it together. So luckily it was, you know, it just sort of was, a, it was, it was the right, it was the right time and the right place for me 
I was 40 years old that year, and I was, you know, wanted to change, wanted something different, and lo and behold, I got it. <laughs> and now 23 seasons, this is my 23rd season, my 22nd year. So After that first year, what was the biggest surprise? I mean, you, you'd been told what to expect at Chautauqua, and then you now experience. What is the biggest surprise? Oh, my goodness. What is the biggest surprise? I guess the passion of Chautauquans. Uh, good, bad, or indifferent. The passion. Whether they love it, they hate it, or whatever. About that passion where people, where people feel that they are totally invested in this place. You know, it is home. It, it is that. I mean, uh, who lives someplace else but comes home to another place, uh, you know, for a few months of the year? I mean, I think that passion was just... Uh, and it was, I mean, the first couple of years, it was very, it was, it was difficult. When I first moved here, I lived in the basement apartment on Terrace. It had only a few windows in the front. And that first winter, living in that little place in, in, the, in that cave, there were times, I mean, I had, I had had a beard. And I literally got so crazy, I shaved my face that winter because I thought, I'm never going to live through this. And that was just a few months before spring came. But, you know, coming from Miami and then living in this dark little hole where I used to live and look out over Biscayne Bay and the entire downtown Miami Beach and all of that, it was pretty amazing. But, so it, it, since 1991, it, the program has morphed from a 10-pager to the tome that it is now. That was a process, obviously. And uh, at some point, I mean, as you built the program and you're responsible more for the program, uh, was there pushback? I mean, how, how did you how did you manage well, it? Chautauqua abhors a vacuum. So whenever they there abhor is a change too. Well, that too, but they abhor a vacuum. So any time that there is ten minutes available that doesn't have something in it, people want to shove it in. Either they don't like what you're doing, or they want to do they are your something's missing from the program that they want to put in, or they want something more to explain what's going on or something. So there's all these ideas. So it was just a slow progression of things. Um, I don't know, I mean, before 1991, there was no Linnae Hall. So Linnae Hall was built during the winter of 92, 93. Sure. So then we started, they said, well, if, I said, if we're going to have a hall like that, we need a professional chamber music series. The, the performances used to be in Smith Wilkes, the chamber music. So the trucks are going up and down the street, and the noise, and you know, you can't have a professional ensemble come and put them in that kind of a thing where they have to stop when the trucks go rumbling by, uh, and that kind of thing. So we decided in, that we, when we opened the hall in the, the Linnae Hall in 1993 that we ought to have a chamber music series. So we figured, you know, Monday afternoon at 4 o'clock, that was a time there wasn't much going on in that 4 o'clock hour. So we decided we'd do that. And so after that, it just increased exponentially over the years, just whatever good ideas people had. And the more you do, the more people want, and the more you just keep giving it to them. And now, we, you know, every 10 minutes you have to be someplace different. So it's crazy. You have a lot of stakeholders at Chautauqua. That's the, the beauty of this place. Uh, and again, another thing, a difficulty I would imagine as to how to manage that programming to, man to appease those stakeholders. Well, I, always, <clears throat> I laughingly say in all due respect, <laughs> my job is to keep everyone happy between the ages of three and death. <laughs> so when you think about the program, and it's difficult because over the years we have seen the average stay shorten. I mean, people, not many people stay a full season anymore. You've got double income families, people have jobs, not everybody can take vacation, the mother and the kids don't come up all the time and dad comes on the weekends. That doesn't happen as much as it used to have. So you're still, you're programming more for the week visitor than you are for the whole program, for the whole season, for the nine-week visitor. So you try to keep all of that in mind. And you're trying to have something for every decade. So you're trying to have something of the people who perhaps remember pre-1940s, the people who grew up in the 40s, the people who grew up in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. And every decade, you're getting more and more people who are older, who like more different, who like more and a variety of different things, but then you've got the generation that is incredibly young. So you're just trying to balance all that out. So you, as you look at the season, I look at the whole thing and I think, okay, I know we're doing, here's, there's some swing music. Somebody, if there's going to be here, loves the 40s, they're going to see that. 
there's going to be some 50s, there's going to be some 60s, we're going to have 70s. I try to do all of that and balance all that out. And in the meantime, you're trying to deal with schedules, the other people's schedules, artist schedules, budgets, you know, this, the practicality of bringing somebody in. Is the show big enough, too big for the amp? Is it something we can't produce because it's too much? If it's more than a couple of truckloads full, we can't put it on the stage. So you're just trying to work all that out. And it's the same with whatever the program is, whether you're working in the symphony, something old, something new, something, you know, something borrowed, something blue. You're trying to do that through the whole program. So it's just, you know, it's just a juggling act. If programming were a science, people would write a book and anybody could do it. But it really is, this sounds really <laughs> egotistical, but it, there really is an art to trying to put it together uh, with all the uh, all the common de all the the common denominators that you're trying to work through for everybody, and all the things you got that you have to work with, uh, including budgets and time frames and and the crazy things that we do around here, and the, you know the miracle that's pulled off here in these nine weeks. It's just astounding. Fresh my recollection. What venues do you have to program? Uh, as far as just locations. Here? Well, the first thing is the amphitheater. So. That's, the, that's every night, Sunday afternoons, and every night in the amphitheater. Then whatever happens at Smith Wilkes Hall, Hall of Philosophy, Hall of Christ, Linnae, Fletcher, McKnight, all the practice shacks, Sherwood Marsh, run the dormitories, all the students, um, uh, visual arts, uh, what's left? Theater. Oh, a theater, excuse me, theater, yes, the theater, yeah. I have to run through all of them. So all of that. So those are the buildings. Yes. I either program them directly or our schedule uh, maintains them and the crews maintain them and we schedule them. Right now we have, uh, we have our institution schedule that, um, Rob, uh, that Oliver Dow, who is the managing director of the School of Music, who is also a computer guru, genius kind of person, we put a calendar together. Right now on the calendar there are there are just about 10,000 entries for the nine weeks of the season, and that includes every rehearsal, every uh, rehearsal for the orchestras, the rehearsals for all of the School of Music events and all the events that are in Smith Wilkes, whether it's the Bird, Bird Tree and Garden Club, the Women's Club, uh, the, um, uh, any lecture that goes in any of those buildings, everything that happens in the Hall of Christ, upstairs, downstairs. By the way, if you haven't if you have not had a chance of the Hall of Christ, it's been completely redone, the mold is gone, it's refinished, you cannot believe how fabulous that building is now. So now we've got our classroom back in the basement. It really looks great, sorry. But anyway, those are the buildings that I do with. So that's Norton, Opera, Bratton, Theater, all of those buildings. We schedule all of that in there. Walk me through a year. You end... Literally, uh, obviously, week nine. You you take a you take a week off, week ten, and then, then uh, when do you start firing up for the next? Okay, week? I usually am try to be out of here by Wednesday after the season. Mm -hmm. I am so near brain dead <laughs> at that time. I mean, I'm, honestly, it feels like you feel like a shell. You feel like if you open your mouth, or the wind just blows through because there's nothing there. You are just an empty person. You have given it all away. <clears throat> You've given everything for, you know, minimally 16 to 18 hours a day, seven days a week, since you, since about Father's Day. So that's, you know, the week, the Saturday before the season. It just, that's when you just work all the time straight through. So I leave on Wednesday. We, we get a four-day weekend on Labor Day weekend because we all work on the 4th of July. So they give the employees Friday off of Labor Day. So we get a four-day weekend. So I take that four-day weekend, Wednesday, and then I take the rest of that week. And that's my time just to go away and recharge my battery. People come here to do that. I have to go away to do that. Um, and then we come back. Budgets are due for the next following year, October 1st. I have to have reconciled my part of the budget, which is just about $8 million, has to be reconciled by the end of September. And year-end projections are due all of it on October 1st. Mm -hmm. So we come back, and you're just going in to figure out where every penny went, where, it, where that money went, you know, what you spent it on, and what, you're, what you think you're going to spend to the rest of the year when you have no idea. I mean, there are so many bills out there and so many things are coming in. You're just second-guessing everything. But you have to do your year-end projections, and then you can say, this is what I think we're going to spend next year. Mm -hmm. And then we start the, 
the negotiations and we fight back and forth about what we have to cut, what we have to do this, because it goes to the board right in the first weekend in November. So, and then immediately, I don't really do anything in programming for the rest of September. It's just as many hours as I can put in to get the budgets ready. Mm -hmm. And then I start working on putting together the program. And I work simultaneously. The chamber music happens, um, the specials, the entertainment in the evening. We're doing all this sort of stuff. And then slowly I get those out of the way and then I work on the symphony then work on the ballet, theater's doing their thing, opera's doing their thing, we're all doing all this sort of stuff, so it just works its way through that. So, you know, the, the, we book and schedule through that, goes through that cycle. Do you work through agents principally or agencies? Most of the time, any, any big artist, any Friday night, you know, the first and last Saturday or Friday night, any of your big names are all artists. They don't, I mean, with agents, they don't do any of that. that they're, that's... Their job is to perform. They have agencies to do that. Some of the smaller acts that come on Friday nights, some of the family entertainment stuff uh, that we do on Tuesdays in Smith Wilkes, those we deal directly with the artists on some of those. It just depends. But most artists, unless you're fairly small and don't charge a lot, uh, don't or do have management because they just have to. If they're busy, they have to have somebody else take care of this. Because agents not only negotiate your fees and do the contracts, they also often schedule the travel. They take care of every detail as you go through, whether you're a classical artist or whether you're a popular artist, a contemporary artist. You have to have somebody that helps you with all that because it's so complex these days. Just tr getting to one place to another, when you're doing one night at Chautauqua and the next night you've got to travel 500 miles and be ready for the next show the next evening at 8 o'clock or whatever time their performance is. Mm -hmm. It's very complex. So you're doing a lot of agents. You're working mm -hmm. with a lot of people. And you never meet these people. It's all done now. You don't even talk on the phone anymore. It's all almost entirely done by email. The marquee events are the Friday nights. That gets your biggest publicity, certainly outside the area. Uh, I assume you have uh, no uh, lack of people bringing ideas to you. Never. <laughs> <laughs> There's the, uh, agents are constantly contacting you. It used to be that you would get, in the old days, you got a cassette tape or you got, a, you know, you got some kind of a tape or recording or whatever. You didn't get a video. There was no such as that thing. So you got, a mag, you got the little cassette tape. And then you started getting CDs. So you would get 700 CDs a year from everything you can imagine. Every kind of music you'd hear. So you get that. And then you started getting DVDs as they got more complicated. So you get... And now... You get nothing like that anymore. It's all done on the internet. It's all done on YouTube, you know, all that kind of stuff. Facebook, it's, that's where your connections. And everybody sends their stuff and links, which is great, which is great because you're not having to deal with this. You can go on and click on something fast, look at it, and like an audience, if it doesn't grab you in a certain amount of minutes, click. You go, and I'm changing the channel. Uh, you get up and leave in the app to change the channel. Uh, here, you just click off and you know you either say thank you, no thank you, or you know whatever you say to back to them. So, but you get my average probably fifty to sixty emails a day that are just people trying to get to get to their artists to come to Chautauqua, and that would be just popular stuff. I'm not talking about classical stuff. That's a whole nother ball game. But that again is all done with links to to uh, YouTube and uh, Facebook stuff. So when you get the Friday night acts, obviously those are the bigger named acts. Uh, do you have in your your own mind's eye going into a uh, post-September mindset saying, I really want to get, this is what I'd like to do weeks one through nine? No, not, it's not that structured. I have, there are, there are ensembles or artists that I think would be great to have. I never presume to say, oh, wouldn't it be great, I can only take them in week one, or I can only, uh, forget it, you'll never get anybody here. You have to be totally flexible. I remember when we had, the last time we had Tony Bennett, before he went sky high with his price, he changed his date three times to try to get me to cancel it, because Microsoft picked up his tour and they like quadrupled his fee. And we were getting him for literally a song, and he was being paid you know, five times that much because Microsoft picked up his tour. So anyway, we had to move him around, and I have to, I'm constantly juggling, 
you'll be holding three dates for an artist. Well, we'll hold this date, this date, and this date. And then you've got somebody else coming in, and you're holding the same artist on the same date. Mm -hmm. And you're working this around. So as they come in, and you get, well, I'll take them on that date. And then you have to go through and say, okay, these dates are off the board, people. You can't, I'm, I'm done. So sometimes it's first come, first pick on these things. Or it comes down and they'll say, we will only come on such and such a date. This is the only date it works for us. And you wait sometimes four, five, sometimes even six months for someone to confirm. Uh, sometimes, like this year, Garrison Keillor is going out on tour with the radio show, which is not the broadcast. It's the same cast as the live broadcast, but it's just a, tour, it's a touring show that they're going out. That we worked on, I worked on that probably for four months, and then for two months we couldn't announce it because he didn't have a title. So when it came time for ticket sales at Chautauqua, I got the actual title two days before they went on sale on April 1st. We got the title. We were just going to say Garrison Keeler, an evening within Garrison Keeler, and they said, well, you know, we know we can't allow that. So we couldn't make a public announcement about it, even though it was out there. So there are all kinds of things you have to deal with. And people will give you a date, and then they will say, okay, we've got a confirmed date. I'll sign a deal memo which says we agree to this and these are the things that you have, we have to do Chautauqua in order to get this deal. And then I'll get an email saying or a call saying, well, they've decided they're going to go to Niagara Falls Casino uh, because they're paying three times as much. They've offered it up for three times. Would you like to up your ante? Uh, no, I'm not going to pay that kind of money for this artist. So. That's out, and then I'm back to square one because I've already confirmed that date and thought that date was set. I have to go back to start over again. That happens once in a while. It happens with the Salamanca uh, uh, casinos, and it happens up at the Niagara Falls kind of thing. Once in a while. It's not so bad. We're, they're getting better about not doing that so much because it really pisses off. Pardon my expression. It really annoys the presenters when you start doing that to them. And they get a bad rap. And we start telling each other, you know, you know if you want them, be prepared, right. and the word gets out. So, You talked about the AMP, and, and our title tonight is A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the AMP. Uh, I know you have back here vignettes of actors, mm -hmm. uh, acts, which perhaps have surprised you. Uh, I know you've talked about it. I'll just throw out Johnny Cash as a guy who didn't perform here uh, <laughs> a few times. So why don't you, let's start well, with that. Interesting enough. Before my time, Johnny Cash had canceled three times at Chautauqua. And so when I, w I don't remember what year it was, they called me up and said, Johnny would like, Cash would love to come back to Chautauqua. I said, how much? This is the deal. So I thought about this and I called him back and I said, okay, I'll book, because I would have loved to have had Johnny Cash at Chautauqua. I mean, this is an icon. I said, I will book Johnny Cash, but I want in the contract because of our three times, three strikes, you're out. If he cancels, I want it in the contract, that he must pay us that fee. And they said, oh, we can't possibly do that. I said, but it's fine. You will cancel, and we're stuck. <coughs> if we've sold tickets, we're stuck with that, and we have to find somebody else. Even if it's, you know, if it's a month in advance, it's still a problem, because people are upset, and you can't always get every person that has bought a ticket, and a lot of people don't pay any attention once they buy tickets to you know, press releases and things that saying it's been canceled. And they said, no, we can't do that. And I said, well, then I'm not taking a chance on him for four times. Because what's the old thing, once, shame on me, shame on you, shame on them. Well, I said, I'm not going to be shamed a fourth time. Chautauqua's not going to be shamed a fourth time. So we let that go, and, and, you know, and that was the end of it. And then, obviously, years later, he passed away. But, uh, there, you know, there are all kinds of stories, good, bad, and indifferent. It's so hard. People say, what's your favorite thing? What's this? You know, and I always say to them, what ch which of your children do you love the best? Because <laughs> every event that takes place is like a child. I mean, it really is. That sounds kind of stupid. But it's true. You think about this thing. You envision it. You, you get them. You negotiate. You get them here. You know, you, the drivers go and pick them up. We house them. We get them on the stage. We deal with every conceivable thing, whether it's their the way they're fed, it's the, their microphone, it's the tuning of the piano, it's the palm trees that Keith puts at the back of the stage if we have to decorate it, it's the surfboard for the, the, the beach boys, you know, all these things. You, you literally are, you see this thing germinate 
you tender it, you tend it, and it grows up, and it gets on the stage, and you're like a proud parent. This thing has come off, and it's a good thing. And you know, sometimes the kids disappoint you. Sometimes they're not perfect. Uh, other times they're just unbelievably wonderful, and everybody goes crazy, and you love that. So you go through that on every single event. I don't care whether it's a lecture at 1045, every, that's the same way, or the religion department at 2 o'clock, or the preacher at 1045 on Sunday, or you know, uh, the Beach Boys on a Friday night. Every one of those gets that kind of attention because you do that because of the artists and the people and you want the good reputation for Chautauqua, you want them to want to come back, you want them to spread the word, you want the audience to have a good time, so you worry about that. So it's hard to say, you know, um, you know there are some that do, do disappoint you. I'll never forget the time we had the poetry reading and we, I said to the person, please be very careful with the language that you use and that person chose to use the F-bomb several times in, the, in a poem. And I will never forget the people. I just got lower and lower in the seat. I thought, I'm going to be crucified for this. And people were really unhappy. And then there was Jason Alexander who came. And mis that was a misrepresentation of an evening if I've ever had one. And people got really upset about that. So, you know, but... Well, for those who may not have known, what was the Jason Alexander story? Well, it was a... It was, um, shall we say, that it was... It was kind of vulgar, you know. It was not a good. It was not a good show, and we had made what we had seen, what was shown, what was assured to us is not what came on the stage. There was a big surprise about that, and that was I was really unhappy. And then there was the time that Wayne Newton came and was sick, and didn't tell anybody that he could not sing a note, and the evening was just a disaster. And he didn't do anything to help the audience. If he had to come out and said, ladies and gentlemen, this is a bad night, I'm having a bad night, I, I'm having vocal trouble, I've got laryngitis, you know, but he didn't. And so it made everybody angry, as opposed to saying, help me get through the evening, my musicians are going to come on. I mean, I remember when Tammy Wynette was here and she was so sick she couldn't get off the bus. And so her band came out and played and we went out and said to the audience, she, I'm, unfortunately, Ms. Wynette is, not, is ill and she's not going to be able to come, and the band went on and played, and she was with somebody else, I can't remember who the second act was, and they came out and helped, and it was, and it was saved the evening. Mm -hmm. And of course, she, she died shortly after mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. uh, same with Mel Torme. You know, he died within, Chautauqua was his last big performance before he died, and that was pretty sudden. You know, and then there was the night that Myra and Florin had a stroke on stage. <laughs> and that was terrifying. We had to get him off the stage and load him into the into the ambulance, take him to West, uh, West to uh, WCA, stayed with him all night. We had to get Bobby and Rolna English on the plane the next morning to get them to the next gig because they didn't want to cancel on the people. So they went and did the gig without him. He stayed in West in in WCA for a few days until his family got here. Then they took him home, and uh, I remember because what I. We were all loaded in the car. Bobby the dancer, you remember Bobby, yeah. who was Lawrence Wilkes, or uh, Myron Florence's son-in-law, and we're all in the English and myself and all their luggage in my car. <laughs> and we went from the hospital to the, to the Buffalo airport to get them out so they could get, get their really early morning flight so they could get the next gig. Then I came back, and that was the Saturday morning of the board meeting at the end of the season. So went right to the board meeting and told everybody, well, we got, we got him out of here, but that I'll never forget that was quite the night. Yeah. <laughs> I've never had anybody have a stroke on stage before. I've had people collapse backstage, but never have a stroke on stage. So that was an interesting story. Do you ever have any performers, for whatever reason, because you start pretty promptly at 8.15, where oh, yeah. you couldn't just get them, I mean, it, the crowd gets a little ugly if it gets too late. Well, interestingly enough, one of the things that really upset me, I'm just, you're not supposed to talk uh, tales out of school, but anyway, we had, um, oh, what's her name? Um, uh, oh, shoot, just went out of my mind. Um, uh, oh, geez. We had a singer, and she refused to leave the hall. It was at that, the, 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 uh, she was staying in Jamestown at the, uh, it's now not the Holiday Inn, but it used to be the Holiday Inn. Okay. She refused to leave that hotel until the intermission. We were to call the hotel and have the driver ready, and she was to be brought in the car, in the van, 
the minute the intermission started, she was to be picked up in Jamestown and brought up here. I don't know if you remember this. She would not get out of the van because, she, and she was sat at the back of the amp. She would not get out of the van. She was playing, I don't know, solitaire or cards or something. And she sat in the van and she made the audience wait. We had done our 20 minutes intermission. And I think it was at least 15 minutes she made the audience wait before she went out. I was really, really angry because I thought, this is ridiculous. There is no point, you know, there's no, no reason for this. That is just, I think, just being rude. And so that was, I was not very happy. And I will, I, you know, people do that. I will never have them back. Mm -hmm. I will never have them back. Uh, I've had artists who threatened lawsuits in the amph in their dressing room, literally screaming at me because they didn't like the way the wording was on the color calendar. <laughs> <laughs> and really? said, I'll have my lawyers. And I said, I'm sorry. This, I am, it's, it was stupid. It was something so ridiculous. But they just went off. They went off on me. I thought they were going to rip my head off. Well, they were. They were just yelling at me. I said, we have a show to do. Then they went on the stage, and they were pretty nasty that night. They were pretty unfriendly to the audience. They were not very... The audience picked up on that. But, um, and then we have the performer that goes out and says, they don't pay me enough. Why can't they pay me more at Chautauqua? That doesn't make me happy either. <laughs> Publicly, you mean? Yeah, yeah. They went out and said, you know, I'm not getting paid enough for this gig at Chautauqua. They should be paying me more. And I thought, well, you know, this, that's not classy. That's not classic. It's, first of all, your age, if you don't know happy, talk to your agent. Your agent negotiated this contract. You know, I'm not that good at negotiation to get, get them down so cheap. But, uh, you know, those kind of things. You, you, you deal with that, you know. And the times the microphones don't work. I mean, it's one thing when you go out and give the introduction and there's no microphones. You're sitting there yelling at the audience because they can't find that the thing's on mute. Uh, but when it doesn't work for the performer and you get people really angry, you know, or when the fire alarms go off three times during your concert and you walk off the stage and the first thing, the first person you see as you walk off the stage is me waiting at the bottom of the stairs up the center exit, just ready to scream, why have you done this to me? You know, I'm sorry, it's, you know, and it wasn't really a fire, it was that we had a problem with the electrical system in the amp and it was setting off the fire alarm in the attic. <laughs> oh, that was that was really unfortunate, but I got my comeuppance because the next year this person came back because his mother-in-law he told his mother-in-law she could go anywhere she wanted for her vacation and she wanted to come back to Chautauqua. <laughs> so they they the artist and his wife and the mother-in-law came and stayed at the Athenaeum Hotel the next the next year. And he was really angry because people didn't recognize him as he walked around the ground. So, they make a big fuss. <laughs> so I got my comeuppance on that one. Can I do the postscript on that? Yes. Can I name the name? Yeah. Okay. Uh, just, just, just. Steve was telling the story uh, when we got together well, a few months or so ago, and uh, the uh, performer was Art Garfunkel, and uh, when he came back, I didn't know the mother-in-law connection. But outside where we used to have a, a condo, there was a guy in a hat with a little kid, curly hair, in a hat, and a bicycle. And I walked out, and I looked at him, and he sort of looked at me, and I looked at him, and I said, Art Garfunkel. And he goes, yes. He goes, you were great last year, you know, that type of thing. And I never shy about asking for an autograph, so I pulled out of my card because I was on my way to a PNC uh, luncheon. And I pulled out my card, and it was blank on the back. And he wrote, what's your name? To Greg, best wishes, Art Garfunkel. And he turned it over. And he said, who's this? I said, well, he's the governor of the state of Pennsylvania. And he goes, Tom Ridge, huh? What party is he? I told him, he's Republican. With a scowl, he handed it back to me and said, you have a keepsake. Art Garfunkel never signs anything Republican. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> So my, my only postscript to this whole story. <laughs> Often the crowd, do, 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 do you sense the crowd pretty quickly as to whether that person who you've selected or people or concert you selected is, is either making it or not making it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's why I walk around all the time. Not only that, I, that I, if I, I can't sit on the benches because it kills my back, uh, but I do... I walk around and I watch the audience. Number one, we watch for incidents. 
health incidents, you know, somebody falls, have people have heart attacks. I mean, these things happen. You know, <coughs> the, our audience is not young anymore, mm -hmm. majority, <laughs> so we have to watch those. So we're constantly watching for anything that should happen in the audience. Uh, and then, and I try to look and gauge what people are doing and how they're enjoying it. And often I stand back by the gate and watch them as they leave, as they scour as they leave, or they won't look, or they won't look at me. They'll look away, or they won't look at me as they leave, you know. Or they, you know, say, oh, I love it, but I'm so, so, so tired, I gotta go home, or whatever the excuse is, so. But yeah, I try to do that. And, you know, and I try to have an honest reaction too, um, so that I, you know, and I, if it's not happening, I, I pick it up as fast as, I mean, as fast as the audience does. But it's amazing, you know, you have something that's really great and people leave and you get the, the hardcore that stays for the end and are sort of down on the, on the level and, uh, and you think, gosh, I'm so disappointed that people didn't like this, mm -hmm. didn't go for it, it wasn't their thing or whatever it is, but you know, that happens. Do you Doug, keep a diary? Do you do a, a post-mortem on things? Unfortunately, I have never kept a diary. Mm -hmm. I'm too lazy to keep a diary. So, and as and uh, if I have to, if I ever write a book, I'll have to go into hypnosis to remember all of it because <laughs> it gets filed in the drawer and the drawer gets put, you push, push shut, and I have a hard, I'm having a hard time. I mean, I'm going to be 63 this year. And I'm having a hard time remembering stuff. Oh, shut up! <laughs> this, this is the wrong crowd for this, you know? <laughs> Come on. Hey, it's traumatic for me. <laughs> I was always the youngin' in the Get group. <laughs> yeah, so... But it's terrible, you know? It, we'd laugh all the time in the audience, in the office, about, you know, who's having the most senior moments at the minute. Because I can't... You know, I used to could remember what happened uh, you know, on November 12th at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, oh, yeah, this happened. You know, now I, can't, I can barely remember November. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and that, I, that's a big part of my job is memory, is remembering all this stuff because, you know, when you have so many things right. going on and you're trying to make the connections, it's all, about, it's all about my job in the summertime, I mean, other than the, all the stuff, but it's keeping everything connected so that what's happening here and what's happening there, that people are paying attention and you're, you're covering your bases because if, if you have, for instance, you arrive at 9 o'clock or 8 o'clock on Monday morning and the 90 chairs that are due at Lene Hall for the band camp have not been delivered and I have 90 students arriving at 9 o'clock on buses and parents to, deliver, uh, delivering them and there are no chairs for them to set up for the orchestra, the jazz, all these rehearsals are going on all over the School of Music, I have a big problem. So I have to make sure that all of these things are happening, you know, that we're covered, our bases are covered. And even though you remind people and you send emails and you call them on the phone, you still have to make sure that things happen, whether, no matter what it is, because there are so many opportunities for things to fall apart. And one major train wreck can cause a disaster here because things happen so fast. You know, if a driver doesn't show up at the right time or is given the wrong time to pick up somebody at the airport and they go at 3 a.m. instead of 3 p.m., we have a huge problem, especially if it's, you know, somebody really famous who's not going to be really happy, you know. So we have to make sure all of these details, and that's what it's all about. It's all about connecting the dots, keeping the umbrella, keeping that whole umbrella of the program, all of it going. I don't know, there's something... Pick your metaphor. You know, the, all the wheels have to be round, not a square one, because you can't have anything go wrong. And if something goes wrong, you've got to fix it fast. You've got to make decisions. You've got to get somebody on the phone. You've got to kick butt if you're going to get stuff done. And so, you know, that's what that's what it happens. That's how it all happens here. You've been at this over 22, 23 years. Uh, are, are you looked towards by other institutions? I mean, are you sort of that... Uh, a state to say, use the term senior because that'll offend you, and you want to, you don't at, at your advanced age you don't want to hear that. But, <laughs> but nevertheless, I mean, are you at a state? Are you a, are you one of the go-to people in the in the uh, area? Well, quite honestly, we are pretty isolated up here, and in the in the in the world in the 
There we go. Again. That's not six o'clock, so that, that bothers me. Oh, is this a regular Tuesday night? Yeah. It happens all the time in my performances. It oh, okay. Well, I mean, it happens to me all the time in the summertime. Not only it scares me to death, but okay. It always makes me really nervous when that goes off now. We've had so many weird things here lately. It makes, it makes me frightened. But anyway, uh, so, I mean, in the outside world, quite honestly, people call up and say, how on earth do you do this? You know, what's the secret to doing this? They'll call me and say, you know, Gosh, we're doing, we do 10 concerts this year. Oh. <laughs> and I say, okay, what's the question? You know, well, how, how do we, you know. So um, I think the nice thing about it is that if I call somebody, they always take my call. Even the biggest managements in the, in the world, mm -hmm. ICM, William Morris, these are the popular places. They all take my phone calls. And I call somebody for a classical artist, they take my phone call. That's mm -hmm. what's really nice. I mean, you may not get the result you want, but you right. get, you, but they, they listen to you, they answer your emails, and they, and they answer your phone if you, if you call an initial, an initial call to set up a, a relationship with them. They take and that's good. But we get a lot of, I get a lot of, I get a lot of questions. The amazing thing is that I get a lot of questions from young people. Teachers who will say, you need to go talk to this person at Chautauqua, they've expressed an interest in the arts for, as, a, as a career mm -hmm. move in their life. Whether as a musician or a singer, I shouldn't say it that way, as instrumentalist or a singer or a, a sound person who's interested in sound design or recording or whatever, you know, whatever the visual or performing arts they're interested in doing. And they say, go talk. So they, they'll call me and say, I've got somebody, will you spend an hour with them? And in the summertime, uh, they'll come to a, they'll say, we're going to come to a concert. Can we talk to you backstage before the concert? So I'll sit in the back porch at the amp, uh, you know, at 7 o'clock and talk to somebody about their life and what, they, what to expect and what they need to do if they're going to come into this world. And it's even, you know, it used to be difficult. Now it's nearly impossible to do it because there are just so few jobs out there now. So, what? yeah, that's what, that's, that's really interesting because I get, you know, you get, you know, you don't know anything. I know nothing. All I can do is give them some pointers and experience and try to head them, you know, say, these are things you need to think about if you're going to do these things and these are things you need to think about in your life uh, as you approach, as you approach this. 20 some years, Chautauqua, 1991 is your baseline. You got 2013. Uh, Chautauqua, what's changed? I mean, a program, well, we know the number of programs, but what's philosophically changed about this place? What has changed? What hasn't changed? I mean, it's amazing how much has, has changed. Um, the first thing I'll say is that the amazing thing about this job is, I mean, this, I'm being serious, you watch the generations come and go. You know, we're looking at, I mean, we're just, you know, Susie Follinsby is the last of the Follinsbys of that generation. Mm -hmm. She's the last one. They're all gone now. And the next one is now Jeff. Mm -hmm. You know, and you think about this in the families. Um, uh, those of you who know Flora and Ross McKenzie. Flora, <coughs> you know, not, not long for this world. Um, and uh, Flora McKenzie has pancreatic cancer. Mm -hmm. And is very, 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 very ill. Pancreatic. Cancer. <coughs> Yeah, so you know that you watch this, and that's I mean, you watch the generations come, the new the kids come, and you watch their grandparents or great grandparents pass on, and that really I mean, that really keeps you in touch. I think this more than any other place, I think, here. I mean, in when you look at arts festivals and that kind of thing, and the world of the visual and performing arts, that really keeps you in touch with the mortality. Because you see, the, you see. I mean, we all age, but you really see that process as the generations. Uh, but I mean, Chautauqua has become so much more complex. Chautauqua has become much more open. That's become much more friendly. I think uh, when you look at to deal with gender, race, all of these things. I mean, when I came here in 1991, there were very few African American people on the grounds. Very few of them. <laughs> you know, very few. And, and look how, I mean, and I'm amazed, you know, we still, we still need more diversity, don't get me wrong. But you see, you see mixed race couples 
who feel very comfortable here. And they don't often go from, and they often say, they're comfortable coming to Chautauqua. And look at families now that have mixed race children, adoption and children. The whole thing, the whole world has changed. And Chautauqua has changed with it. We're a little bit slower than the rest of the world, but it's amazing how much it's changed mm -hmm. and how much more open we are. I think, uh, you know, and I think that's very, I think that's good. Uh, I think that the basic principles of this place to develop, that we each are trying to develop in our, our own way to be the best that we can be as human beings, I think that has not changed. I think that there's great pressure on this place to be different uh, as Chautauqua has, as the world has changed and people expect more, they want more, they expect a higher quality of everything, whether it's their bathroom fixtures to, you know, to what's being performed on Friday night, every, you know, the expectation is being raised. And that's, that's difficult for a place like this, which is, you know, which we pride ourselves in walk, that when you walk through the gate, you're walking back a hundred years. Mm -hmm. You know, we say we like that. We like that it's the set for the music man, whatever, you know, whatever the cliche we use for that. But it, it you know, it, it's different. The audience is, we're changing and the audience is changing. People are changing. The way we live is changing. How we communicate. Oh my goodness. I mean, I remember when we did mimeograph. <laughs> and then, you know, and everything was typed. And then we got copiers, and then we got computers, and you know, and now, and who knows what we're going to be doing in a few years. We'll have a chip installed, and we'll just, you know, <laughs> talk into something, and we won't even, I mean, it's just amazing. Uh, just to see how things have changed. How fax machines have become almost obsolete anymore. It's just astounding. All of that has changed, and boy, it's been hard for us to keep up. It's been hard for Chautauqua to, the, the, the revolution, whether it's in, you think about coming from buggies to vehicles and just our streets, the width of our streets. And mm -hmm. you hear the, the week before the season when you cannot move in this place because there's so many cars parked and trucks and construction and everybody's coming back. You think about that and you think about that electronically these days and that's what's exactly what's happening in our electronic world, the volume of stuff that's coming through and everybody can get to you. You know, anybody can go on ciweb.org and send a message to somebody saying, I love you, I hate you, or whatever. You know, and we're very, we're very open and to that. I mean, we're accessible to that. That has changed a lot. We're not, you can't hide any. There's no place to hide anymore. I think of that because I have to respond to every person that sends me something. I try to respond to that person in some way. It won't be what they want to hear, but I do try to respond to them. Mm -hmm. You know, and nowadays to respond in writing, you know, maybe you write 12, 15 letters a year to, in response to someone who sends you a program. But most everybody sends everything electronically. And that does make it a lot easier because you do a lot. You know, when you're doing five, six hundred emails a day trying to take care of business, you know, you're, you know, you're just putting it through as fast as you can, mm -hmm. trying to keep up with all this stuff. Can you project out 10 years what this place might look like? Well, it'll look the same. It'll look better, but I still think you know the library is still going to be there. Maybe the amp will be a newer version of the amp with more handicapped accessibility. That's not sliding down the hill towards the lake. Mm -hmm. uh, all those kind of things. Uh, maybe our roads will be better. Will we ever have our power lines under, buried under the ground? Probably not. Uh, uh, but and I think there will be more houses will look nicer, there'll be more paint. But I think that the spirit will still be here. I really do think. I mean, you think about 1874 to now, there are certain things that have, that have not changed. The world has pressured us to change, but we've not, we've not changed. I mean, we've not totally changed. We have not given up the ghost. I, I think it's, I think it'll still be here. Is I that do. its charm? I think that's an asset. I also think it's a liability. It just depends on how you look at it. Mm -hmm. You know, if you come here and want fabulous gourmet food, you ain't going to get it. <laughs> you ain't going to get it. It's not going to happen here. You know, uh, if you're going to expect a grocery store, if Wegmans to show up on the grounds, that probably is not going to happen either. That would be huge changes for able to be able to support that kind of an economy here, let alone in, in this area, let alone you know, in, inside Chautauqua. But slowly things are gonna, slowly things will evolve. 
but I do think I think there's tremendous hope. I mean, if there's no hope at Chautauqua, what's the, what's the hope in the rest of the world? Yeah. I really do think that's true. What's next for you? Are you here for the long haul? Before the before Chautauqua in my life, I had never lived or worked any place longer than seven and a half years. Mm -hmm. I just constantly did accomplish something and then moved on to the next thing. And I, I really think, you know, I've grown up at Chautauqua. As I said, I started here when I was 40. I was, you know, I was not 40-year-old mature person. I was a 40-year-old kid. Uh, I'm still a kid, but I'm not 40 anymore. <laughs> but I really have grown up at Chautauqua, and it has offered me something that probably I could never have gotten anywhere else. I mean, where you often get a chance to conduct the Mormon Tabernacle Choir twice <laughs> and orchestra twice without, you know, without ever having a, a, never having conducted in your life before, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, where do you have those kind of opportunities? Where do you get the chance to meet all these kind of people and just, you know, whether it's the audience, the Chautauquans that come or the people backstage, you know, people say, oh, you meet all these famous people. I said, you know, most of the time they're just like anybody else. They're terrified, they're nervous going out there, you know. So these are things. I mean, I'm, I'm here until I decide that it's time to hang it up and go be, move south where it's warm in the winter. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess, or else they can get rid of me. I don't know which one, which oh, one comes right. first. Yeah. But uh, well, I think I speak for all of us. We're just glad you're here. And yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Marty Merkley. Oh. Yeah.